Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Um, so I, I got thinking about this and I was like, how's the best way to, to tackle this sermon this morning? How, what's the best way to kind of bring this forward and, and throw it out uh, to, to you guys, to, to the church here this morning? And, and I got thinking, you know, about the provision that God has, has given us as a church. The provision that God has given us as a church. And if you've joined us in the last two or three months, you, you, you may not have seen or you probably won't have seen the provision that God has given us as a church. And uh, especially if you're a visitor here this morning, uh, if it's your first time here, we welcome you. Pray that you've enjoyed yourself so far. Um, hey, it's, there's more to come. It's going to get better. Um, you know, you, again, if you're a visitor, you, you won't have seen the, the provision that, that God has, has been or, or, or given to our church. And, and um, you know, the ones of you who have been here since the beginning, since the beginning, 1984, my birth year, um, Oh, yeah, anyway, we could, we could make jokes and stories about that. But 1984, um, if you've been with us since about then, um, till about three months ago, in fact, you'll absolutely would have seen the provision or the hand of God providing for us as a church. And, and um, you know, we, we plan to have our church history written up and, uh, and on display um, within the building here uh, in the near future, uh, including all the call, you know, to, this, to, to start the church, to... to to, to, um, to birth it, I guess, or the, the call that was on Weston and Annette. Um, we we want to get that plastered up on the wall because I think it's a good thing to, to remember our roots and where we've come from. And, and, you know, a lot of us know that history, but, but I want it to be in our face. I want it to be there in front of us so we can remember, hey, where we've come from and, and what God has brought us through. Um, and, and part of that is, is I, want to, I just kind of want to show the journey of all the different buildings that we've been to and, and all the different uh, venues we've been in. Um, see, if you've been with us for a while, uh, the only way you wouldn't have seen or felt or tasted of God's amazing provision uh, for us as a church would be because you have no pulse. Um, it's simple as that. Like God has been so evident. He's been so real. And um, if, if you've been with us since 1984 and you don't feel God's provision, I would seriously go to the doctor. Um, check your pulse because man, God has, has been working and he will continue to work, and, and that's what's exciting, you know. Um, God has continually provided, for example, with buildings, different venues, places where we've been, and, and um, I mean, there's countless ones. I'm not sure the exact figure, and I won't quote it just in case I get it wrong, but there's been plenty of different buildings. Um, the other thing I, I think of that, that God has provided is just ideas, you know. When you have a church that's been running for, for as long as Tim Zealand, it's like, man, is there any fresh ideas left? Um, you know, my, my dad's a bit of a, a creative thinker, I reckon, um, in, in his own right, in a different way. Um, a practical bloke, but as well teamed with mum, you know, the, the ideas that were kind of bouncing around and, and that have come out over the years have been incredible. God has provided those ideas, the dreams, the vision. Um, what about willing workers with, with loads of gifts and talents? Um, if, you, if you think back through the years, we've always had someone running our youth group. We've always had someone running our kids program. We've always had an incredible worship. Um, we've had great preaching. There's, there's been so many great assets of our church, and, and, and that's come down to people, willing workers who are just loaded with, with gifts and talents. Um, finances. Um, what about just the general strength of the church? Uh, what about the blessing? What about life and joy? You know, just to mention a few things, we could, we could go on. Um, I, I suppose I, we better mention the insurance as well. We've been blessed with our recent insurance claim. And um, those of you who have uh, been with us just recently in the last 12 months, you've you've really seen that that, that blessing or that hand of God um, in it, you know. So, oh, it's great. On top of that, also the amazing provision in the lives of the congregation, in the lives of you guys. You know, there's been people who who have gone on to be with the Lord, who have been with us for many years who've seen incredible amounts of provision in their lives. Other ones who've gone on to, to different places, different churches, different towns, different cities around the world, the provision within their life. You know, I, I just think of the youth group and the different guys that have, and, and girls that have gone through our youth group who are now in, in you know, quite significant places of, of leadership within churches around our nation. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's awesome. You know, God has provided. Be encouraged. You're in a church where God's hand is for provision. God's hand has provided, and God's will continue to provide. And, you know, this encourages me. This encourages me in so many ways, and, and I hope it encourages you. It gives me a real sense of peace, that Jehovah Shalom, that, that hey, we're, 
We're in a church where God is in the house, you know, where God's hand is for us, not against us, that God's hand is to provide, not to, not to discipline or, or, I mean, he will discipline us as well, but, but you know, to provide, to, to bless. And uh, that, that's, that's so encouraging. That's so encouraging. But you know what? God isn't just about providing for churches and denominations, although I do believe Elam's quite, you know, it's up there on God's special list. Um, you know, I, I think Elam's right up there. And, you know, the, the 12 disciples, let's, let's deliberate for a second. The 12 disciples, there were three of them, eh, that were kind of in the inner circle, that were the elite, that were just sort of head and shoulders above. They were the ones that, that God loved, that were, that were close to him. I believe that's Tim Elam, you know. We're, we're one of those three. I haven't worked out who the other two churches are yet, but um, once we do, we'll start relating with them and, and hanging out with them. It'll be good. But um, for the time being, Tim Elam, you know, we're, we're right up there. But, you know, God isn't just about providing for churches and denominations. He's not just about churches and denominations. He's, he's about providing for us personally and for our families. Providing for us personally and for our families. And, and I can absolutely say that because he's done it for me. He's done it for my family. And, you know, I don't have to stand up here and tell any white lies or, or tell any uh, tall tales because it's not the case. God has blessed. God has provided for me and my family. And, and that blows me away. Uh, you know, and, and since little Adelaide has come along, um, you can't help but begin to think about, about her growing up. And, and as a parent, um, you guys all, or most of you will know, you know, you begin to worry, don't you? You begin to worry about your kids. Um, you worry about their health. You worry about their development. Oh my gosh, I hope she's, you know, I hope she's going to develop. I hope she's going to, you know, be smart like her dad, good looking like her mother. Um, no, nah, yeah, no. Nah. Good looking mother, I don't know about smart dad, but anyway. But you, you worry about their school. You worry about education. Um, you worry about their relationship with God. I know some of you, I've had conversations with you, you know, you, you, you're concerned and, and worried for, for your children's uh, relationship with Christ and, and their salvation and all of that. Um, you know, you, you begin to even uh, worry about their relationship with, with others and et cetera, et cetera. It's just kind of this never-ending, consuming thing, I think, as a parent. And I'm only just in this first, like, stages of it. Um, everyone's going, you just wait till she hits teenage years. You just wait. If she's anything like you were, boy, that's what mums say. You know, one thing I know that, that is, yes, my parents provided. Um, occasionally, they didn't provide after rugby practice, sitting in the dark, waiting for a ride, you know, in the cold, waiting for mum to pick me up. Yeah, yeah, I'll pick you up. I'll pick you up. And uh, the coach said, do you want a ride? You should, no, no, mum's coming. It's coming. Well, I'm the last one. It's getting dark and cold. No, no, she's coming. And then, you know, you're sitting there in the field under the trees, huddled in there, snowing. No, not quite. <laughs> And then you see mum drive past the other side, you know, on the other block, and it's like, oh, there's mum. Oh, she'll come around. Oh, no. She's gone. Oh, no, they're finished. He must have got a ride home. <laughs> She's gone. Oh, no. It's tough. But no, my, no it, I, that, that might have only happened about 20 times. <laughs> Wasn't too bad. We didn't live that far away. Only a few miles, a few k's. Late at night, hungry. Woe is me. Now, one thing I know is my parents did. They, they, provided, they provided really well for me. But, but God also provided for me. God also provided for me. And, and you know what? He will also provide for my children. You know, if Jess and I continue to follow him, if we continue to raise that banner, Jehovah Nissi, if, as we continue to raise that over our lives, then God will continue to provide. He will continue to bless. And, and, and um, you know, that's... that's Man, that's something that's so valuable. You know, money can't buy that. Like, that's, that's, yeah, it's, you know, we're rich when we have that. You know, you, we talk about finances and wealth and, and riches and the top 10, you know, rich list or whatever, but, but real wealth, real riches is knowing these promises that God will provide, that he will look after. And um, that, that's huge, you know. If you're worried about your children, I just want to say to you this morning, just continue to raise that banner. If you're worried about the friends or, or their relationship with Christ or, or what's going on at school or, you know, I, I talked to a, a mate of mine, he's, he's not in the church, um, and a guy that I've worked with and his, his kid, he got the phone call. Um, it's actually a broken marriage as well, and, and so he doesn't get all, he gets some of the secondhand information. Got a, got a phone call about a week later um, saying that uh, his, his, his boy had been tied up with um, smoking 
the, uh, the wacky backy in the, in the toilets. And um, yeah, you know, like it just gutted him. It just hit him. And he was like, man, what do I do? You know, how do I change this? So I'm almost disconnected from the family. I, I don't have much influence anymore. I think it's come from the, the stepfather and all this kind of carry on. And he's, he's just at a, a point of, of just like, what do I do? Like, you know, it just seems like he's at a cul-de-sac with, with no left or right hand turn options. And, you know, I just, I was gutted for him. And, and, you know, I just, I did what I could in the sense of, hey, man, you know, well, if there's anything we can do, um, you know, get him along to youth group if you can, or, you know, we'll be praying for you. I mean, he knows where I stand, and, and um, he's always thankful for prayers. But it's like, you know, if you're not a Christian, if you're not in the faith, if, if, if you're not actually lifting that banner, that Jehovah Nessie over your life, if you're not lifting that over your life, then, then you're actually not, allowing or giving space for God to provide for you, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, eh? It's a tough one. We need to continue to pray for those who are, who are in, in those kind of situations. We need to really pray. Got a bit sidetracked there, just thinking, you know, about, about my family, about God blessing us and, and, and providing for us. You know, God has opened doors of education and vocation in my life. And, uh, you know, when I think about it, it's not just any old door. It's not, you know, God doesn't just go, oh, well, it's just Nathan from Thames, small town. Just give him any door he'll walk through, he'll be all right. You know, God doesn't just give us any old door, but God actually fabricates and, and designs and sets up. And, and you could even take it to a whole other level that, you know, he was, he was a carpenter, that was his trade. He, he'd act, he actually prepares and, and, and builds and, and creates and, and this masterpiece of a door that he sets up. He sets these doorways up in our life for us to walk through. You know, he sets up the, 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 the light, as it were, um, and, and the dark path, and, and this is our God. And, and in my life, it's not just any old doors that he's set up. He's, he's set up doors that, that, that he'll lead me through that will give me growth that I need. You know, and I think about, um, I think about the develop in my own life, uh, the development or, or the, the, the characteristics that God has built into my life or the character, and I think, well, where does that come from? You know, part of it has come from the church. Part of it's been anchored in, in a Christian family and, and part of a, a Christian church. But a huge chunk of my character has come out of my work force, you know, as out of, out of my working situation, my vocation, out of the friends that I grew up with, with, the, with the, uh, the school that I went to. And you've got to actually give credit to God in these areas that he's opened up these doors in our lives to grow the character and to develop the character that he actually wants in you. That he'll, that he'll harbor within you. You see, if we go in our own strength, you know, and keep kicking down doors and pushing our way through, you know, the character that we build into our life is not necessarily the character that, want, that God wants to have in your life. And um, I'm so thankful for, for starting at the bottom as an apprentice, straight out of school at A&G Price, and, and working my way up through, you know, like, that, that built character. It built grit into me. And um, I wouldn't say I'm the grittiest person or I've got the most amazing character, but... God really took me through those doors and, and, and cemented character within me in that place. You know, I think as Pentecostals, we get all super spiritual sometimes and think, oh, you know, character's got to come from God and only in the church and all of this kind of stuff and prayer and supplication and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, intercessory stuff and we've got to be prophesying and, uh, you know, and all this speak, speak it into being. But actually, it does come from the grind, the daily grind of, of turning up to the factory you know, or turning up to your workplace or turning up in those times of, of fatigue and tired and, and just doing the grind because that's where character is getting built as well. And God provides that door for you. There's always those doors that God provides. The other thing is, uh, what have I got written here? He continually, he continually provided and withheld what I needed and what I didn't need. Have you ever felt like that, that stuff's been withheld from you at times, you know? Where you feel like it's like, oh, I really need this, or I feel like this is what God wants for me, but it's almost like it's being withheld. You know, I like to think, actually, we talked about it before the service, and it was, you know, it was, it was cool to see uh, just a few eyes like popping and opening and, and, and thinking that concept of actually, yeah, God is withholding some stuff from us because it's, the timing is not right. That, that actually the season we're in, if we, if we have that, that's going to build the wrong kind of character. We, it's going to build the wrong kind of thing or, or it's going to develop you in a wrong kind of way. In fact, God wants you to go this way. 
And, and God actually, he, he has doors for us to go through, but he has doors that, that are closed, that, that are restricting us, that, that are stopping us, that are, that are protecting us. As simple as that, protecting us. So if you ever feel like something's being withheld, then, then it's a chance that God's actually, he's holding, he's, he's withholding, he's holding you back because he knows you don't need that. You don't need that in this season. One cool thing that I've noticed is every single time, and I can say every single time a door is slammed in my face, every single time a door is closed in regard to uh, a, a place to live, um, housing, uh, when it's come to work, when it's come to finances, when it comes to just doubt and confusion, whenever a door seems like it closes in front of me, God kind of just turns my attention, changes my perspective to another door that you know, is, is sitting there on my left or my right that I just didn't even see. You know, God actually will open or provide these other doors that, that we don't even see at times. And, and I've seen that, I've felt that, I've had that in my life. And it's, it's, um, it's amazing. It really is incredible to know that, hey, if a door slams closed, if I, if I just wait on the Lord, if I just wait and give Him time, if I don't try and, you know, rustle things together and organize it, because that's what we do, eh? We think, okay, this door's closed, I need to do this. You know, I need to provide it for my family. I need to do these things. I, if I'm not doing this, you know, I'm, I'm failing. I'm not keeping up with the Joneses or whatever. But as we just wait in God's presence, as the door closes, I encourage you to just wait. Just wait and just say, God, give me your eyes to see. And, and quite often, he'll probably just give you a little nudge. Oh, there's a door right there. <laughs> Where did that come from? I didn't think that was there before, you know. And, and, and suddenly, there's, there's, there's this new opportunity or this new door to walk through. Every single time, and I can say that with, with confidence, every single time. What about when it comes to dreams? You know, we're all dreamers, aren't we? We're all dreamers. Some of us more than others, we like to dream. Who likes to daydream? Anyone like to daydream? Sometimes I do my best work when I'm daydreaming. But, um, you know, we're, we're all dreamers, but, but what about our dreams? The dreams that God has put into our heart. For me, he's always provided an outlet for those dreams, you know? And that, that's, that's pretty unique. That's pretty special when we really begin to think about it. The dreams, the desires of our heart. You know, has, has anyone had a dream or a desire and it's just so frustrating because you just can't get there? You can't do it. You can't action it. You can't seem to get your teeth into it. Well, I tell you what, God has always provided an outlet for me. And I think, God, why, have, how? You know, I've, I've worked with guys who have, who have just, man, you know, real creative guys, and they just, yeah, they're just oozing with all these dreams, but they just don't know how to connect the dots. Or I believe as we spend time with God, He will provide an outlet for those dreams that are within us. You know? And, you know, if, if, we're, if we're caught in, in a workplace and we're bored or, or we're, you know, we're struggling through a, a situation and, and we're just dreaming, constantly dreaming of that, 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 that grass that is greener on the other side, I believe as we just wait in Him, as we just sac you know, sacrifice afresh to Him, fall down at the, the cross as it were, or continue to lift that banner of Jesus over our life, then I believe He'll, he'll continue to, to shape and show us different doorways, different outlets for our dreams, for our dreams to come forward. And what's cool about that is it, it teaches, well, it's taught me to, to be a big, a big dreamer, to, to be a dreamer, to, to dream big. Because we serve a big God, a big God who's, who has an endless currency of provision. I like that, an endless currency of provision for those who love him, for those who follow him, for those who lift that banner. All right, so we've looked at, at some provision for our church. We've looked at provision for myself and my family personally. And, and I hope it's kind of caused your, your mind to think about where God has provided for you and, and what he's done for you. I, I kind of just want to take it to a whole other level. Let's you know, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. Let's, let's take it to another level. Let's see what Scripture says. And, and if you've got your sword, that's what they call it, the sword of the Spirit, is it? Um, grab your sword. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 22. This is where this reference, Jehovah Jireh, comes from. Genesis 22. And um, I have preached out of here before. I'll probably preach out of it again sometime because it's, man, there's so much packed in here. This is such a great chapter, such a, a great amount of verses. 
in Scripture here. Genesis 22, verses 1 through to, uh, I think we're going to read to, yeah, we'll read to 19. Is that what I've got up there? All right, I'll trust you, Gail. I'll trust you. All right, sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. So right there, you know, um, Abraham, like, let's get into the story for a second. Let's just not read it, eh? Let's get into the story. Let, allow your imagination, all your dreamers begin to start, you know, dreaming into this, thinking about this, tasting the dust, trying to feel what the temperature would have been like there. Think about it. God replied to him. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. So straight away, Abraham's like, okay, what's my schedule this week? Oh, no, we're yeah, no, there's not too much on this week. I could probably, you know, actually, I, if I leave tomorrow, um, yeah, if I leave tomorrow, we, Mariah, what's that, three days, three days, yeah, it's a, yeah about a week, and then, then I can get into that project, you know, that's coming up. And oh, I've got to take the boy. Okay, sweet. I'll just have to ask his mother if you can get out of school. Yeah, a week of school, off school. Yeah, we wonder if we can do that. Yeah, no, that should be sweet. So he's, you know, he's thinking, okay, yeah, no, God, sorted, sweet. We'll be good for, you know, I'll be able to leave in the morning. And then the verse continues, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I tell you about. Can you imagine his eyes would have popped out of his head. What? Sacrifice. Sacrifice as a burnt offering. Uh, pretty extreme, eh? Pretty extreme. Anyway, verse, uh, verse 3 goes on. Early the next morning, Abram got up. I love that. He, he committed to, to the fact that he was leaving the next day. He, he just got straight into it. He, he, he followed straight away. He didn't go, oh, I'll put it off for a week, maybe a couple of weeks, oh, maybe next year. He just got straight into it, you know? How many times do we, do we get a nudge or a, a, a kind of like, you know, hearing the voice of God and we think, oh, maybe not. You know, this is, this is cool. Take some advice from Abram. He just got into it. Early the next morning, early the next morning, Abram got up and he saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, three days, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Interesting language right there, eh? Verse, uh, the back end of verse five, it says, stay here with the donkeys while, while I and the boy go over there and we will worship and then we will come back. He already knows he's going to sacrifice his son. But he uses this, this language, which is just interesting. I just thought I'd point that out this morning. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac. And, and all you guys will probably know the similarities in this story to the crucifixion of Jesus. You see, Isaac carried the wood on his back just as Christ carried the cross on his back as they ascended the hill, as he send, ascended Mount Moriah. As he started to go up there, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. There's more similarities that are going to come up as, as we continue through the story. And he himself, Abraham, carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And uh, when I read this, I suddenly think, man, I should probably pay more respect to my father. Um, you know, I'd, if, if this was me and dad, it'd be like, hey, old man. Um, <laughs> hey, old man. And, and he'd be like, yeah, what, boy? Um, I'd be like, uh, are, you, are you losing it? Is that Alzheimer's kicking in or something? The fire's here, the wood's here, but, but where's the lamb? Have, have you forgotten something? And he would probably would have been like, shut up, boy, or else it'll be you on that altar, you know? <laughs> And um, I don't know, was this the conversation, like this is kind of a bit of a more modern day sort of look at it, isn't it? But um, maybe that's just God speaking to me that I need to be a little bit more polite to my father. Father, yes, my son. <laughs> Wait for him to say, yes, my son. <laughs> uh, where did we get to? Uh, we'll read from verse eight. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. The two of them went on together. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar, and there he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on top 
Oh, he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And this morning, I don't want to get too caught up in the emotion that's in this, this little story and these verses right here. Can you imagine what's going through, not just Abraham's mind, but through Isaac's mind? You know, the, 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 the intense emotion of, of suddenly, hey, maybe even that awkward joke before about, hey, where's the, where's the lamb? Here, yeah, look out, boy, it might be you. It actually, you know, like, oh my gosh, this is starting to actually, this is getting real. This is getting real because, Dad, I'm getting tied up. What, what are you up to here? What are you doing? And um, it, it would have been, the emotion would have been thick, probably thick enough to cut with a knife. Did you see what I did there? Check out the next verse. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife. He took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Do not do anything to him. And I just want to pause there for a second. If God calls your name, I think it's pretty wise to, to listen, eh? If God calls your name, I think it's pretty wise to, to, to listen. And if he calls your name twice, I would stop what you're doing right away, you know? And I'm, I'm trying to think of someone I can pick on this morning. Maybe I better not. It might be a bit, a bit mean, but um, just thinking, Jossie, Jossie, <laughs> stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. If you hear your name called twice from the Lord, definitely stop what you're doing. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said, verse 12. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns and he went over and he, he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. See, the Lord provided a sacrifice to save Isaac's life. And that familiarity that I was talking about before, the Lord provided a sacrifice to save the sin of the world or to save us from the sin of the world, to save us from our sin. He gave his only son, sent him to die for the sin of the world, for you, for me, that we may have life and have it in abundance. But these beautiful similarities in this story. We go back to verse, verse 8. It says, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And, and I can't help but, but remember John the Baptist. Remember, he, he said, look, it's the lamb of God, Jesus, the one who takes away the sin of the world. The lamb was a substitute for Isaac. And the lamb of God was a, a substitute for us. You see, the emotion that, that both Abraham and Isaac felt when the Lord had provided that ram in the thicket. You know, when, when Abraham looked up and, and saw that, that lamb in the, uh, or that ram in the thicket and he had the knife in his hand and, and Isaac probably looking at him and, and looked across at the lamb, that relief, that sense of, of, of God has provided, you know, that's the kind of, uh, of feeling. That's the kind of thing that we should be remembering when we think about Christ being our substitute. That moment, the feeling in, in that intense moment that's that's when we come to the communion table that's what we should be thinking about that god actually sent his son for us as a substitute verse 14 it, it goes on to say so abraham called this place the lord will provide and to this day it is said on the mountain of the lord it will be provided the lord will provide jehovah jireh this is the reference where Jehovah Jireh comes from right from this verse right here. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. Remember we had, we had Gideon talking about, he, he built an altar and he said, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is, is peace. Who did we have last week? Can anyone remember? Can anyone remember? Jehovah Nessie, who built the altar and called it Jehovah Nessie? Moses, the Lord is my banner, remember? And now we've got, we've got Abraham here. He's, he's declaring, he's saying, it's almost like he'd built this altar already, and again he's declaring, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. I, I love that. You see, there's these significant moments in all of these three guys' lives where they, they recognize the hand of God. They recognize the voice of God. They recognized 
God intervening in their situation, and they made that a milestone. They cemented that in their memory because they knew this was special, that, that hey, I, I, I can't forget this. In fact, I know my children need to know this, and my children's children need to know this. This kind of stuff needs to be passed down, and, and um, yeah, it's, it's some cool stuff. You see, the Lord will provide. Just look at the language again here. It says, the Lord will provide. It doesn't say, and on that day, the Lord provided for Abraham, or it doesn't say the Lord did provide for Abraham that day. It says, Abraham called this place, the Lord will provide. It speaks of provision for the future, not just for, for then, not just for now, but forever. But forever. The Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. You see, for Abraham, obedience led to provision. And this might be a bit of a key for some of you guys here this morning. Just to, just to wrestle with this thought, for, for Abraham, obedience led to provision. Regardless of the cost, regardless of the personal cost to him, Abraham obeyed. Are there, are there things in our lives that we're, that we're waiting on God's provision for? That we're thinking, oh, what, God, why are you withholding this? What's going on? Like, Lord, where is your provision in this situation? Because, man, God, I'm up against it. Maybe you need to think about your obedience. Maybe you need to think about all of these little things that, that the Scriptures, you know, command us to do. Spend time in His Word. Re read the Scriptures. You know? What about caring for the needs of, uh, of, of the needy? What about forgiving those who have, who have trespassed against you or wronged against you? You know, and the list can go on. Sometimes provision is withheld because there's no obedience on our behalf. For Abraham, obedience led to provision. See, God tested Abraham through his son, or you could say with his son. And God may test you with other people. He does definitely test us with other people sometimes, doesn't he? God sent this person to test me. I've, how many times do you hear that? Yeah, I've heard that a lot in my life. God may send people to test you. He, he may use other people. He may even use your own children like he did for Abraham. But just like Ab Abraham, we need to obey. Obedience to God leads to provision from God. Obedience to God leads to provision from God. And I just want to jump across to Hebrews chapter 11, the great uh, chapter of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, if I can find it. Someone's taking it out of my Bible. Oh no, here it is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through to 19. It says here, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises... Sorry, I'll read that again. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God has said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise him from the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. And that's just this kind of cool couple of verses that kind of sum up and, and really give that punch to the story that we've been reading. And uh, I like that. Figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. He was tested by faith. And I just want to read this little bit of a study note kind of um, section out of this Bible here because it's quite cool Ar around those verses. Abraham was willing to give up his son when God commanded him to do so. God did, God, sorry, God didn't let Abraham take Isaac's life because God had given the command and in order to test Abraham's faith. Instead of taking Abraham's son, God gave Abraham a whole nation of descendants through Isaac. If you are afraid to trust God with your most prized possession, with your dreams, or maybe with a person, pay, pay close attention to Abraham's example. Because Abraham was willing to give up everything for God, he received back more than what he could have ever imagined. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's pretty amazing. I want to think about that for a second. You know, at this point when we start thinking, oh, Abraham received back more than he could have ever imagined. How many of us start thinking about that old character, Scrooge McDuck, swimming through his money, 
you know, DuckTales, whatever that show was. And um, old Scrooge McDuck, you know, just, he was spitting out money. And uh, he's just swimming in it, backstroke and diving through and big smile on his face. You know, we can't help but go to that point when, when we think that, man, God's going to give us more than we can ever imagine. We can't, can't help stopping our minds go there. That, man, God's going to provide so much money for us that it's, it's going to be great. But yes, God's provision may be materialistic. But materialism doesn't count for, for what really matters in life, especially not in eternity. Let's look at the provision that, that God actually gave to Abraham because he was obedient. You know, yes, he got his son back. And if you think about it, yeah, he, he figuratively speaking, he, he, he gained his son back from the dead. You know, that was payment enough. You know, that, that was enough, but, but God didn't stop there. He, he gave him so much more. And let's, let's have a look at it, eh? Let's go back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, uh, verse 15. We'll read a few verses here. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time, and he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. I will surely bless you and make your descendants great in number. See, this is this, is this, this extra, this, this bit more that, that, that we're talking about. You see, Abraham and Sarah's bloodline was set to end. They were old. They were older than any one of you guys in this room. They were old, <laughs> and that's pretty old. No, they, were, they, were, they were old. Their bloodline was set to end. They, they had no children that bared, bared the two of their, their seed, if you know what I mean. It was, it, was, it was coming to an end until that miracle son Isaac was born in their old age. See, Abraham obeyed, and he was prepared to give him up. Even though he got this incredible miracle child, this incredible blessing, God then said, hey, no, I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to give him up. He was prepared to do that. And now God promises to greatly increase their bloodline all of a sudden, and he did that. You see, Isaac, was, there, was a, there was a substitute, a sacrifice was provided for him. He received him back from the dead, as it were, and, and then all of a sudden, from Isaac, his, his descendants were going to be so numerous, were going to be so, so incredibly massive. And, and, and I love that. God did that. The bloodline increased. See, the bloodline was set to end. Don't forget that it was set to end, that, that a miracle took place and then God tested them with that miracle. What are you going to do with that? Yeah, yeah, I've blessed you with this incredible creative miracle, but what are you going to do with that? Are you going to hold on to that and keep it yourself? Or are you going to give it back to me again? God sometimes tests us in these kind of ways. We need to, we need to be sharp. We need to be aware. You see, God's provision and blessing is multi-generational. It's capable of, of continuing through generation to generation. And we've talked about this in the past, in, in the last few weeks, or the last few months at least. God's provision and blessing is multi-generational, capable of continuing through the generations, continuing to pass on down through the line. See, part of Abraham's blessing wasn't just for him, but it was for his descendants that would, would, would flow, that would continue on. Verse 17b, I've, I've got it illustrated here, the second part of verse 17. It says, Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And again, God did this. God absolutely did this. As, as you read through the history, as, as you read through the accounts of, 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 uh, of Scripture, and, and you know what? He's still doing it today. But this is a part of the provision that God gives to us. And it's this to possess the strongholds of the enemy, to overpower, to overcome, to drive out, to take possession of, to take possession of the enemy's assets, to take possession of the enemy's influence and hold and reach. And that sounds nice, but let's, let's apply that to us, eh? Let's put ourselves into what I just said because it just went straight over everyone's head. I, I didn't see anyone getting excited about that at all. Let's apply this to our lives, to our families. Think about it. What, what are you coming up against at the moment? What, what's your family coming up against? What's the enemy trying to throw at you? What's the enemy trying to throw at you? It says God's provision 
says this, we will possess the influence and the reach of the enemy. We will possess the strongholds and the high ground of the enemy that we are facing. We will possess the assets and the lifeblood of the enemy. You see that verse talking about the, the cities of their enemies. What does a city refer to? It, it refers to the strength of, of, of an of a area, of a region. It talks about the wealth of, of the strategy, the reach, the influence. And God is saying that, hey, I will give you the possession of the cities of your enemies. So what is coming up against you? God is saying, no, no, if, if, if you will obey me, then I will give you the possession. I will give you the influence of, 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 of you know, not the, the, the strength of darkness, not the influence of darkness, but the strength that the darkness holds or the, the high ground that the darkness holds or the enemy holds. I, I will give you that. I will give you that reach. I will give you that strength. Do we believe that? Because that's, that's what Abraham was promised, not just for himself, but for his descendants, that they would possess the cities of their enemies. I love that. God, God's provision, God's provision, it'll wipe out the enemy's foothold. With God's provision, we, we will conquer the enemy. With God's provision, we will possess the enemy cities. Verse 18 just, just kind of finishes it off. And through your offspring, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And we know this is speaking about Christ. We know this is speaking about Jesus, blessing all the nations through, through the cross, through the sacrifice that, that he made of his life. This morning, we've, we've looked at God's provision for, for Abraham and for Sarah We've had a quick look at God's provision for our church. And we've also, uh, I've shared really quickly the, the provision that, that God has, has shown in my life for, for myself and for my family. You see, when we are obedient to God, we can expect to step into his never-ending supply of provision. He provided for Abraham. He's provided for our church. He's provided for me and my family. And he will provide for you. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. It's not the Lord did provide. The Lord has provided. The Lord will provide. Do you believe it this morning?